I am now recording. Okay. So, okay. So, no questions with the homework. Last lesson, we ended on how to use the right hand rule to know the direction of u cross v given the vector z of v. Okay. So, this lesson, uh, we are now going to continue. Uh, so, just making some more statements. When students sign in, it screws things up. Okay. Um, Okay, here we go. So if we have the norm of u cross v, it's equal to the norm of u times the norm of v times sine theta, where theta is the angle between vectors u and v, where theta is the measure of the angle between vectors u and v. Okay, uh, so this is theorem uh, 3.5.3. It's the area of a parallelogram. Okay, so if u and v are vectors in three space, then the norm of u cross v is equal to the area of the parallelogram determined by vectors u v. Okay, uh, so if u v are vectors, u and v are vectors in three space, then the norm of u cross v is equal to the area of the parallelogram determined by the vectors u and v. Okay, so on the whiteboard, I wanted to show you what the parallelogram determined by vectors u and v in, in free space is. So if you have a vector, if you have a vector u, which I'm denoting by this red vector, and if you have a vector v, which I'm going to note by this blue vector, then the parallelogram determined by these two vectors is the parallelogram with those two vectors as two of its adjacent sides. Okay, so the parallelogram that has those two vectors as adjacent sides, that is a parallelogram determined by vectors u and v. Okay, so here's p. And so this is the parallelogram determined by vectors u and v. Okay. Um, and so here, theta. Theta is the angle between vectors u and v. Okay. Um, okay so, so just to make life easier for myself, I'm going to switch the names of these vectors. Okay, so I'm going to call this vector u. I'm going to call this vector v. It doesn't change the parallel game because it, the parallel still has these two vectors as adjacent sides. And so I just want to do that because I want to call this vector to make things easier for myself. I'm going to call this vector with this perpendicular there. So now you have this perpendicular and the length of this perpendicular, the length of that thing I just drew in dots is the norm of V uh, sine theta. Okay, so the reason why it's norm of V sine theta is because sine theta is the ratio of the opposite leg of the angle divided by the hypotenuse, right? Sine theta is the ratio of the opposite side, the side opposite the angle divided by the hypotenuse. But the side opposite, the length of the side opposite the angle theta is, um, is that side that we denoted, right, by this symbol here, right? That's this thing, right? This thing is the side opposite uh, the angle theta. And if you divide it by the length of the hypotenuse, that's the length of the vector v. And so sine theta is the value of that vertical thing divided by the, by the norm of v. That implies that the length of that thing is equal to the norm of v times sine theta. Okay, so the, the, I said the length of that dotted line thing 
is nor v sine theta. So right there, I show you why that is. Is there a question or something? Okay, so then the norm of this is the norm of u. Um, and then, right, this is the norm of v because those are vectors u and v respectively. Okay, and so that shows that. Okay, so this is the parallel determined. Uh, P is the parallelogram uh, determined by vectors u and v. Okay, because it has u and v as vectors u and v as adjacent sides of the parallelogram. Okay, so uh, so here's an, an example, example four. Okay, find the area of the triangle uh, determined by uh, by the points P one. Uh, so you can have a parallelogram determined by two vectors. You can have a triangle determined by three points. So P1 of 2, comma, 2, comma, 0. The second point, P2, at the point negative 1, comma, 0, comma, 2. And the third point, P sub 3, is the point at 0, comma, 4, comma, 3. Okay, so we have these three points, and we want to find the area of the triangle determined by those three points. Okay, so on the whiteboard, I'm going to label the three points I just wrote in there. Okay, so this is example four in today's notes. Okay, someone remind me to save the whiteboard notes when class ends. Okay. Um, okay, so um, if you have the x axis, the y axis, and the z axis, um, then first let's plot our three points. So you have P1, whose coordinates are 2, 2, 0. You have the point P2, whose coordinates are negative 1, comma, 0, comma, 2. And you have the point P3, whose coordinates are uh, 0, 4, 3. Okay, uh, so let's say you drew the vector. Uh, let's say you drew one vector from P1 to P2. And let's say you drew another vector from P1 to P3. Right, we want to find the area of the triangle determined by these three points. So what we want, is the area of this light green region, right? We want the area of that triangle determined by those three points, where the three points are the vertices of the triangle. But if you look at the blue vector and the red vector, you can think about the parallelogram that those two vectors determine. And if you think of the parallelogram that those two vectors determine, then the triangle that we want to find is half, takes up half the space of that parallelogram. And so if we find the area of the parallelogram determined by these vectors, if we divide it by two, we get the area of the triangle that we want. Okay? And so the question is, what is the area of the parallelogram? Because the area of the parallelogram will then tell us the area of the triangle. Well, the area of this parallelogram, remember, is the determined by the, by the, the norm of the cross product of the blue vector and the red vector. So if you take the cross product, of uh, the blue vector crossed with the red vector, then by the last statement I wrote, this is equal to uh, the area of the parallelogram determined by vectors u and v, right? And the area of the triangle is half of that area. And so you just find the norm of u cross v where u is the blue vector and uh, v is the red vector, and then uh, the norm of u cross v, and then take half of it, and so the half of that half of that norm is then the area of the triangle. Okay, so the area of the triangle is half of the norm of u cross v. And so let's just do that. So we're going to find the norm of u cross v, half times that is the area of the triangle. Okay, so we're going to do that on word. 
Okay, so the solution. So on the whiteboard, we showed that the area of the triangle determined by those three points is equal to one half uh, times the area of the area of the parallelogram determined by vectors u, v um, in the picture on whiteboard, right? And so the vector u, right? So the vector u is equal to the vector from p1 to p2 on the whiteboard. Okay, so this is the vector from P1 to P2, that's U. And V is equal to the vector from P1 to P3. So the vector U then is then, uh, it's negative one minus two comma zero minus two comma two minus zero. So that's equal to negative three comma negative two comma two. Okay, and then B is P1, P3, which is now uh, zero minus two comma four minus two comma three minus zero. So this is equal to negative two comma two comma three. So that's U and V. And so now the area of the triangle is equal to one half times the area of the parallelogram determined by the vectors U and V in the picture. Well, that's one half times the, that the area of that is uh, is the norm of u cross v. It's one half times. Well, the norm of u cross v um, is okay. So then, uh, so the norm of u cross v is also the norm of u. Oh, right. Okay. So, okay. So that's, I don't want to use that. Wait, I don't want to use that. Okay. So it's one half times the norm of U cross V, but so now you just need to find the norm of U cross V. Um, so it's norm of U cross V. And so now we want to find the cross product of U cross V, right? So, uh, so U cross V is equal to, so now we're just going to take uh, the determinant, right, of the three by three matrix. Uh, so you have i, j, k. The vector u is negative three, negative two, two. And this is negative two, two, three. And so now this is equal to i times uh, the term of the submatrix, which is negative six minus four, which is negative 10, plus uh, minus j 
times the term of the submatrix, which is negative nine minus negative four, negative nine plus four, which is negative five. And then plus K times the term of the submatrix is negative six minus four, which is negative 10. So this is equal to negative 10 I plus five J minus 10 K, which is equal to the vector um, negative 10 comma five comma negative 10. Okay, so I'm just finding the determinant of this matrix using the cofactor expansion along the first row, which gives you this vector negative 10 comma five comma negative 10. That's U cross V. So this is equal to one half times the norm of the vector U cross V, uh, where the vector U cross V is this vector negative 10 comma five comma negative 10. And that's equal to one half times uh, well, now you're just finding the norm of a vector. It's the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. That's negative 10 squared plus 5 squared plus negative 10 squared. And so this is equal to 1 half times the square root of 100 plus 25 plus 100. And this is equal to 1 half times the square root of 225. And so the square root of 225 is 15. So this is equal to one half uh, times 15. So this is 15 halves, which is 7.5. Okay. So the area of the triangle is 7 half or 15 halves. And these notes are the calculations I used for that argument. We found the area of the triangle is one half the area of the parallelogram determined by vectors u and v and times the area of the parallelogram. The area of that parallelogram is the norm of u cross v, and which is, uh, we found u cross v, and then it's a vector, and so the norm of this vector is the square root of the sum of its squares, of the, its components. The square root of negative 10 squared plus five squared plus negative 10 squared. That's the norm of u cross v, where this is u cross v, okay? Okay, so that's the solution to example four. Okay, so next, um, is definition two. Um, if u, v, w are vectors in free space, then u, uh, no, u dot dotted with v cross w is called the scalar triple product of u, v, and w. So if u, v, w are vectors in three space, then u dotted with v cross w is called the scalar triple product of the u, v, and w. Okay, so that's the definition of the scalar triple product. Okay, so how do you calculate that? So u dotted with v cross w is equal to the determinant of the matrix whose first row are the components of U, which is U1, U2, U3. These are vectors in three space, so they each have three components. And then the second row is the components of vector V, and the third row is the components of vector W. And so finding the determinant of this matrix is actually finding the scalar triple product of U, V, and W, which is U dotted by V cross W. Okay, and in this section of the textbook, this is, this is uh, seven. It's indexed by seven. And so that's how you calculate this. It's the, it's the determinant of that matrix. Okay, so in example five, if U is equal to the vector three comma negative two comma negative five, V is equal to the vector one comma four comma negative four, and W is equal to the vector zero comma three, three comma two, then uh, we want to find the scalar triple product of u, v, and w. So we want to find u cross, u dotted with v cross w. And so this is equal to, by seven, the determinant of the matrix where the first row are the components of u, three, negative two, negative five, 
the second row are the components of B, which is one, four, negative four. And the third row are the components of W, which is three, zero, three, two. So you just want to find the determinant of that matrix. So I'm going to use the cofactor expansion along the first column. This could be three times the determinant of the submatrix, which is eight minus negative 12, which is 20, minus one times the determinant of the submatrix, which is negative four minus negative 15, which is 19, plus zero times anything, which is zero, which is equal to 60 minus 19, which is 41. So the determinant of that matrix is 41. So it's three times negative four, or well, negative four plus 15, which is 11. Oops, this is 11 there. This is, wait. No, no, eight minus negative 12 is 20, that is 20. And then minus one times negative four minus 15 negative four plus 15, which is 11. There we go. So it's 60 minus 11 plus zero. So this is equal to 49. There we go. Okay. So the determinant is 49. Okay. So uh, notes from seven. This seven is this expression, the determinant expression for the skeletal product of UV and W. From seven, we get that so you can prove this using the definition of the scalar triple product, U dotted with V cross W is equal to W dotted with uh, U cross V. And that's equal to V dotted with W cross U. Okay, so all three of those quantities are the same. So if you, you dotted V cross W, if you then moved the U forward kind of and then you loop the W around. You have W dot U cross V. And if you kept going, and if you move the W forward and then V looped around, you'd be dotted with W cross U. So all three of these things are equal. Let's keep going a loop. Okay, so next is theorem 3.5.4. Uh, part A, the absolute value of the determinant of the matrix. U1, U2, V1, V2. The absolute value of that determinant is equal to the area of the parallelogram in two space determined by vectors U, which is U1, comma U2. <coughs> Excuse me. And V, which is V1, back to V1, comma V2. B, the absolute value of the determinant, determinant of the matrix, of the three by three matrix, U1, U2, U3, V1, V2, V3, in the third row, W1, W2, W3, the absolute value of that determinant is equal to the volume of the par parallel par pipette in three space determined by vectors u, which is equal to u1, u2, u3, b, which is the vector v1, v2, v3, and the vector w, which is equal to w1, w2, w3.
Okay, so I'll quickly, I already illustrated for you the parallelogram determined by two vectors, but um, I'll just illustrate both of them really quickly now. Okay, so if you have the x-axis and the y-axis in two space, and you have a vector u here, and you have a vector v here, then the parallelogram determined by vectors u and v is just this here, right? That's the parallelogram determined by vectors u and v in two space. Now, if you're in three space, so you have the x-axis, you have the y-axis, and you have the z-axis, you can call them those three. Um, and then let's say you have a vector u, a vector v, and a vector w. All these vectors are in three space, they each have three components. Then you can think of the parallel pipe bit determined by these three vectors, which is this three-dimensional object, which is kind of like a box, but maybe not a, like a slanted box in this case. It's like the box determined by those three vectors. Okay, so you can see that. So this is the parallel pipe bit uh, determined by those three vectors. And so I'm just gonna illustrate this with this pink here. Okay, so that's the parallel pipe bit uh, determined by those three vectors. Okay, so that's, and so the, the volume of that parallel pipe bit is the absolute value of the determinant that I mentioned. And the area of this parallelogram is the absolute value of the two by two determinant I wrote down, right? So the area, the volume of the parallel pipe is the absolute value of this. The area of the parallelogram is the absolute value of that. That's what I said there. Okay, uh, so remark. Um, so if you let V equal to the volume of the parallel, parallel, parallel pipid, parallel pipid determined by vectors U, V, W, this is equal to the absolute value of U dotted by V cross W. So remember that the determinant of this, the absolute value of the, this determinant is u dot with v. I mean, the determ this determinant is u dot with v cross w. Okay. So that's because um, v, which is the volume of the parallel pipe bit determined by u, v, and w, is equal to the absolute value of the, this determinant, which we said earlier. Okay or it doesn't want me to do that. World is still not letting me do that. Try one more time. Nope. Okay, so it's gonna be the determinant of, okay, I fooled where it did anyway. So it's F equals the absolute value of that determinant, but we know that that determinant is U dotted with V cross W. So U dot V cross W is the term to that matrix. And so V, the volume of the parallel pipe, is the absolute value of the term, which is the absolute value of U dot V cross W. Okay, so I proved that statement there. But we did it earlier. So this is theorem uh, 3.5.5. If U is equal to the vector U1, U2, U3, B is equal to the vector B1, B2, B3. And W is equal to W1, W2, W3. Have the same initial position, meaning that the tail of the vectors are all at the same point, the same initial point. Then they lie in the same plane if and only if u dotted with v cross w is equal to the absolute value, is equal to the determinant, of, which is equal to this determinant. Uh, 
that's fine. Okay, it equals to the determinant of this matrix. Remember that you can shorten the determinant with um, the vertical line symbol, right? The absolute value symbol is a shorthand for the determinant matrix. So we're taking the determinant of this matrix here. And so if that, you can only if that equals zero. So if the scalar triple product of u, v, and w equals zero, the scalar triple product of u, v, and w, u down v cross w equals zero if and only if when whenever u, v, and w have the same initial point, they lie in the same plane. Okay. So to illustrate what that means, you just an idea would be like this. If you had um, let's say you had uh, the x axis the y-axis and you had the z-axis, right? That would ignore And so let's say you took three vectors like this. All three of these vectors were in the x-y plane. Okay, so they had no zero z coordinate. They were all just vectors in the x-y plane with the same initial point, the origin. Okay. So all vectors are v1, v1, v2, v3 lie on the x, y plane. Okay. Then what would happen is if you took the if you took the scalar triple product of them, meaning v1 dotted with v2 cross v3, it would equal zero. Okay. Uh, it's saying that whenever three planes three vectors lie in the same plane in this way, then their scalar triple product is zero. And whenever their scalar triple product is zero, that implies that they all lie on the same plane when they all start the, the initial point, same initial point. Make sense? Right? If they didn't have all the same initial points, I could move one of the vectors vertically upward so it's not in the same plane. But if I force them all to start at the same point, then their scalar triple product being zero is equivalent to them all lying on the same plane. Okay. Okay, so that is the end of that. That is the end of chapter three, and now we are on chapter four. So chapter four is on general vector spaces. Okay, so 4.1 is on real uh, vector spaces. Okay, so, um, so when we talk about uh, real vector spaces, uh, we then want to talk about a few things. So we want to talk about the definition of a real vector space. Okay. Um, this is a long definition. Let V uh, be an arbitrary uh, non-empty set of objects on which two operations are defined, addition and multiplication by numbers called scalars. By addition, we mean a rule for associating with each pair of objects, uv in the vector space capital V, an object u plus v called the sum of u and v by scalar multiplication. By scalar multiplication, we mean a rule for associating with each scalar k and each object u in vector space capital V and object ku hold the scalar multiple of u by k. If the following axioms are satisfied by all objects U, V, and W in capital V and all 
scalars k and m, then we call capital V a vector space. And we call the objects in capital V vectors. Okay, so let capital B V be an arbitrary non empty set of objects on which two operations are defined addition and multiplication by numbers called scalars. By addition, we mean a rule for associating with each pair of objects U, V, and capital V, and object U plus V called the sum of U and V. By scalar multiplication, we mean a rule for associating with each scalar K and each object U and V and object KU called the scalar multiple of U by K. If the following axioms are satisfied by all objects U, V, W, and capital V, and all scalars K and M, then we call capital V a vector space and we call the objects in V vectors. So these are the axioms. There are 10 of them. If U and V are objects in capital V, then U plus V is in capital V. Okay, so property one says, if U and V are both objects in capital V, then when you add them, U plus V, it's still in capital V. That's one. It's called closure under addition. Okay, this is called closure under addition. You don't need to know the names. I think I think hearing the name helps. It close, you have closure under addition. When you add two things in B, the result is something that's still in B. Property two is U plus V equals V plus U. This is called commutativity under addition. When you add two things, the order doesn't matter. So U plus V is the same as equals V plus U. Three is U plus uh, V plus W is equal to u plus v plus w. And so you may have seen this before. This, this is associativity under addition. Okay, So the operation of addition is associative. So you have associativity. That's property three. Property four is that there is an object zero in capital V called a zero vector in four capital V such that zero plus U equals U plus zero equals U for all U in capital V. Okay, so property four says that there is an object zero in V called the zero vector for V such that zero plus U equals U plus zero equals U for all U of V. Okay, so property four says the existence of such a thing. For each U in capital V, this is property five, for each U in capital V, there is an object negative U in capital V called a negative of U such that U plus negative U is equal to negative U plus U equals zero. Okay, so for each u and v, there is an object negative u and v called a negative of u, such that when you add u and a negative of u, you get zero. So u plus negative u equals negative u plus u equals zero, and the order doesn't matter. Property six says if k is any scalar and u is any object in capital V, then ku is in capital V. Okay, so K is any scalar and U is any object in V, then KU is in V. So it's closed under scalar multiplication. This is called closure, closure under scalar multiplication. Okay, uh, property four has a name too. This name is called um, the identity property. Okay, the number zero is called the identity for the vector space. Property five has a name too. It's called the inverse property. Okay, the negative u here is the is the inverse of u, the additive inverse of u. Property seven is k times u plus v is equal to ku plus kv. Okay, and this is called left distributivity. Okay, when you distribute, when you multiply. It's like this, but the K is on the left and you're distributing is on the starts on the left side. So it's called left distributivity. Property eight is K 
plus m times u is equal to ku plus mu. This says something different because not only is the thing on the right side, the, the thing that's singled out is a vector. Here, k and m are cons of scalars, and u is a vector. Here, k is a scalar, and u and v are vectors. So we're distributing a little bit different. So this is right distributivity by a vector. This is left distributivity by a constant. Okay, so this is left distributivity by a, by a constant, by a scalar. This is right distributivity by a vector. Okay. Property nine says, if you take K, if you take k times mu, this is equal to km times u, okay? So when you left multiply a vector u by a constant a scalar k, m, and then, and then afterwards by a scalar k, you could instead multiply k and m and left multiply u by k times m. So you can change the order here and they're equal, okay? But it's not, it's not just, it's not quite associativity and multiplication because k and m are scalars and u is a vector. So it's not like two times three in parentheses times four equals two times in parentheses three times four. It's not the same because in that case, they're all numbers, they're all real numbers, right? And you're just moving the parentheses. Here, not only do you move the parentheses, but there's also different types of objects here. You, k and m is a scalar and u is a vector. So this still works though. 10, property 10 is one u is equal to u. This is saying that if you take any vector and you left multiply by the number one, you still get u. So one u equals u, that's property 10, okay? That doesn't always have to be true, oddly enough. Okay, so, uh, but here it is. So we have these 10 properties, and if all 10 of these properties hold, then you have a vector space V, okay? Okay. Uh, so uh, to show, uh, Okay, so actually, so let me do an example. So example of a vector space. It is an example of a space, it's a vector space. So here's a simple example. The simplest one, it's called the zero vector space. Okay, so this is just the space containing only one thing, zero. Okay, so this is an example of a vector space. Um, so, so if u and v are objects in v, then u plus v is in v, right? Well, zero plus zero equals zero. And so zero is in this zero vector space. And so property one holds, okay? So this implies um, that property one holds, okay? Property two says that that the order doesn't matter. Well, this zero plus zero equals zero plus zero. Order doesn't matter, right? Because the only thing you can two things you can add is zero because the zero is the only thing in it. And so again, you have top property two holds. Okay. Uh, property three is that you can rearrange the order of the addition. Well, because there's only zero in the set, again, uh, again, this holds. Okay, so a lot of these properties just hold uh, kind of obviously. Wait. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so that's property three. Um, four is that there's an object zero. So four is true because uh, the, that is the number in, in the vector space. Zero is in V. And so that implies that four holds because that it's defined as the set space with only that thing in it. So it has it in it. Property five says for every object in V, there's a negative such that when you add the two together, you get zero. Well, there is. If zero plus zero equals zero. That implies that zero is the negative of zero, okay? And so that implies That implies that property five holds. So keep in mind that the negative 
of a vector is not defined as, as negative, as putting a negative sign in front. It's a vector that when you add it to the original one, you get zero. Okay, the negative of a vector is something that when you add it to the other your vector, you get zero. Well, if you take zero and you add zero to it, you get zero. That means zero is the negative of zero. And so that, that property five holds because zero has negative and zero is the only thing in the space. So every object in the space has a negative. So property six says if K is any scalar and U is any object in B, then K U is in B. Well, for any scalar K, K times zero is equal to zero, which is in B. So that implies the property six holds, right? The only thing in this space, in, in this vector space, is the number zero. If you take any scalar k, k times zero is zero, and the result zero is in the space only containing zero. So six also holds. Seven says k times u plus v equals k u plus k b. Well, u is the only vector. So if you take any scalar k and you take zero plus zero, that's equal to uh, zero. And uh, k times zero plus k times zero is equal to zero plus zero, which is zero. And so this implies that k times zero plus zero is equal to k zero plus k zero, right? Because k times zero plus k times zero is zero and k times zero plus zero is zero. They're both zero, so they're equal to each other. And so zero is the only object in this space. And so since we showed it work for that one, it works for all of them. And so that implies the property seven holds. Property eight says right distributivity by a vector. It says k plus m times u equals ku plus mu. Well, for any scalars k and m, k plus m times, well, I can choose any vector, but there's only one in the zero vector space. So k plus m times zero, well, that's equal to zero. And um, if you take k0 plus m0, that's equal to 0 plus 0, which equals 0. And so that implies that k plus m times 0 is equal to k0 plus m0. But 0 is the, that works for any vector in the vector space. If you plug in for 0, 0 is only 1. And so this implies that 8 holds. Property 8 also holds. Property nine says k times mu equals km times u for any scalars km and u. Well, if you take k times m times the zero vector, that's equal to k times the zero vector, which is zero, the zero vector. And if you take km times the zero vector, it's a, it's a scalar times zero vector to zero. And that implies that k times m0 is equal to km times zero because they're both equal to zero. And that implies then that k times m0, that implies property nine because they're only the zero vector in this space. And so it works for the vector zero in it, the only one. And so this works for any u in the vector space, which is only zero. So it works for zero, so it works for all of them. And so property nine also holds. One times u equals u. Well, if you take one times the zero vector, you take one time, I'm gonna have to write the notation so we can see what I mean. One times the zero vector is equal to the zero vector. And so that also holds. One u equals u for every vector u. And so the vector here is, u, is zero. So one times zero equals zero. And so that implies uh, that property 10 holds. And so I just showed us that all 10 properties hold for the zero vector space. And so since, all 10 properties hold for B equaling to the set containing only the zero vector. That means that capital B uh, defined in this way is a vector space. It is called the zero vector space, okay? So vector space containing only one element, zero element. Okay, the, the zero vector space is unique. 
Okay. Um, another example of a vector space um, is the space of all M by M by N matrices. Okay, so that's also an example of vector space. All ten, all ten axioms. Old. Okay, and so you can show that that is an example. That is an example of a vector space. So example seven in the book is is an example of a set that is not a vector space. Okay, so I proved how one is a vector space and I told you that the space of n by n matrices is another vector space. And in this example, it's an example of one that is not a vector space. Okay, so in order for a set to not be a vector space, one, at least one of the 10 properties have to fail. Not all of them, uh, just at least one. Okay, so let V equal R squared and define and define addition and scalar multiplication as follows. Okay, so we're going to define the operation addition scalar as follows. If u is equal to the vector u1, comma u2, and v is equal to the vector v1, comma v2, then define their sum u plus v to equal u1 plus v1 comma u2 plus v2. Everything looks fine so far. And if k is any scalar, is any real number, then define scalar multiplication ku equal to k u1 comma zero. Okay, so we defined our set of objects, which is R2, which is the space of all two tuples, right? Note that V is, we already wrote this, I'm writing it again, V equals R2, which is the space of all, or the set of all two tuples, which is, Another way to say it is the set of all ordered uh, two pairs, or say it's all ordered pairs, where their components are reals. Okay, with, with, with real components, with real components, meaning an ordered pair is, is something comma something else where the two somethings are real numbers. Real components or real numbers as components. Okay, it's a set of all two tuples R two. So our space is a set. Our vectors are our potential vectors are the set of all two tuples. We're adding them component wise the way we normally would. So u plus v is ve as vectors in two spaces. U one plus v one comma u two plus v two. But scalar multiplication we're not defined the normal way. Normally you would take each component of your vector and multiply it by the scalar k. Here we're changing the definition of scalar multiplication for our vector space or our potential vector space. To say k times a vector u is equal to k times the first component u1 for the first component, but the second component is zero. Okay, and so we want to show how this is not a vector space, right? The addition looks normal, but the scalar multiplication doesn't. And so your first clue is maybe this is the problem, which it is. Okay, so the problem with this is that let's say you look at the 10th axiom, which looks like the easiest one. 1u one equals u, which seems obvious and should work, but now it fails. And actually, some of these other ones that look kind of weird work. Some of the weird ones work, but one times u equals u fails in this case. So um, let's say we took the vector. Um, so let's say we chose the vector. We chose the vector because uh, we have the space of all two tuples. So let's say we chose the vector 2, comma 3 um, in R2, which is a vector space B, right? So let's say we choose that vector. And let's say we choose, we chose, say we choose. So choose, okay. So let's say we choose the scalar A to equal five. Oh, wait, wait, 
8 equal 1. Okay, so, um, so KU here is going to equal 1 times the vector U, which is 2 comma 3 in our, in our case, right? This can happen because we have R2 is a space of two tuples, 2 comma 3 is a two tuple. The scalar, scalars could be any real number, and I chose 1. So then one times this vector two comma three, which is one times two comma three, according to this, our, our definition of scalar multiplication here, you multiply the first component of your vector by one. So your first component is one times the first component of your vector comma, the second component is just zero no matter what's happening. So that means this is equal to the order pair two comma zero. So one times u, one times the vector two comma three is two comma zero. Okay, uh, condition 10 for a vector space. Requires that KU requires that one U equals U. For any vector U in vector space in in set B. Okay. Uh, but we have here that one times U is equal to two comma zero and U is two comma three. So this does not equal U. We have that one U does not equal U. So condition 10 fails. Okay, and that means that the that means that B equals R two with the given operations of addition and scalar multiplication fails to be a vector space. Okay, a vector space is a team of things. It's not one thing, right? The vector space a vector. This is not a vector space, right? But the V here is not what you would um, say is a vector space. So like, for instance, you know, I can't to explain this. I don't want to use this example. So this fails to be a vector space with property 10. Earlier, I said that an example of a vector space is the space of all n by n matrices, right? OK, uh, the space of all n by n matrices with, with, um, with standard matrix addition and standard matrix multiplication by a constant is an example of a vector space, okay? So a vector space is a team of three things, okay? A vector space is a set, an operation of addition, and an operation of scalar multiplication, standard uh, scalar multiplication. Um, of a matrix, okay? Standard scalar multiplication of a matrix. Standard, standard multiplication of a matrix by constant. Okay, so the space will n by n matrices with standard matrix addition and standard multiplication of a matrix by constant is an example of a vector space, okay? Um, so, okay, so a vector space is a team of three things. It's a set of objects. It's an operation of, of, of addition. And it's an operation of scalar multiplication. Okay. Um, in our last example that failed to be a vector space, R2 is the set. The addition, how I defined it, is the operation of addition. And the operation of scalar multiplication is that operation of scalar multiplication. For those three things, I say, is that team of three things a vector space? And in this example, no, it is not. If I change the operation of scalar multiplication, and I have the same set, R2, the same um, operation of addition. But I change this definition of scalar multiplication to the normal one, KU equals KU1 coming KU2. It will become a vector space, OK? So you can't say the set itself is not a vector space. You're saying that the team of three things, the set and the operation of addition and the operation of scalar multiplication is not a vector space, OK? So a vector space is a team of three things. So students get confused why in this example, R2 fails to be a vector space and another example, R2 is a vector space. 
it's because the operations are different. Okay. You're always when you're talking about vector space, you're always talking about a team of three things. Okay. Mathematicians will abbreviate a vector space by writing a set. They'll write V as a vector space, right? Where V is R2, right? And so V will both represent the set and it'll be used to represent the team of three things. A mathematician expects you to know the difference between when V is just the set and when V is the team of three things, okay? So the meaning of notation changes in terms of context. So you have to know the context in which symbols are in in order to know what the reader's talking about, right? But anyway, a vector space is a team of three things where 10 axioms hold. If any one of the 10 axioms fails, then you do not have a vector space. Those three things that those three things that make up a team is not a vector space. If all three ax, all 10 axioms hold, then your team of three things is a vector space. Okay. So with that, here's a theorem. This is theorem 4.1.1. And so this is let capital V be a vector space. U a vector in V and K a scalar. So we're assuming Ray, that B is a vector space. So we have all 10 axioms holding it by assumption for this team of three things. Then <laughs> A, zero U is equal to zero. B, K times zero is equal to zero. C, property C, Negative one times u is equal to negative u. And d, if k u is equal to zero, then k is equal to zero or u is equal to zero. Okay, uh, so this is theorem 4.1.1. Okay, v is vector space, u vector in v, k is scalar. Remember, V is a vector space, is a team of three things. Here, V is referring to the set in the team of three things, okay? So here, like I mentioned, the meaning of V can change uh, in one sentence to the other, but you have to know by the context what they mean. So by saying V is a vector space, we mean V represents a set V, an operation of scale multiplication, and an operation of, of, of addition, right? Those three things. And then it says U is a vector in V, meaning now B is representing the set in the team of three things that make up a vector space. Okay, so same symbol, two different parts of the sentence, meaning two very, two different things, but two very similar things, okay? A says that if you take the number U, scalar U, multiply it by any vector U, it equals zero, where zero is a, is a, is a zero vector, okay? On the left, zero is a constant, a number, and on the right, zero is a vector. Again, context is what matters. Here, you're taking a vector u. And so since you have it right next to it, it's not, you're not cross-producting it. And so you assume it's scalar multiplication. But now, if you take scalar multiple of a vector u, the result is still a vector, which means you can't equal a number. It has to equal a vector, a zero vector. Here, zero is a vector, and you're left multiplying it by a scalar k. k is notation for a scalar. And saying zero here is just obvious. So you, you're not interested in k times zero equals zero. As in the context of linear algebra, we don't care about that. Zero is a vector. You're multiplying by scalar k. The result is a vector, which means on the right, it's still a vector zero. OK? So this is a vector, and this is a vector. This is a scalar, and that's a vector. Negative 1 times u equals negative u. OK? That's saying if you take negative 1 times any vector u, you get the negative of that vector, negative u. And D says if KU equals zero, if you take a, a scalar K and multiply it by a vector U, I meaning you get a scalar multiple, and you say it equals zero, if that happens, then either the scalar K is zero or U is, or the vector is a, is a zero vector, or U is a zero vector. Okay, so that's part D. So that's that theorem. So that's the end of that section. And 4.2 is now on subspaces. Okay, so here's definition one. Um, in this section, subspaces 4.2. A subset W of a vector space B is called a subspace of capital V if W is itself a vector space under the addition 
and scalar multiplication operations defined on B. Okay, a subset W of a vector space V is called a subspace of V if W is itself a vector space under the addition and scalar multiplication operations defined on V. Okay, so again, this can confuse people because the usage of the same letter for two different reasons. Okay, W is changing from earlier in the sentence to later in the sentence. Saying a subset W of a vector space V is really saying, if you have a vector space V, it's a three team of three things, a set V, an order of an operation of addition, and an operation of scalar multiplication. Okay, so it's saying that W is a subset of the set V in the team of three things where V is the set, you have an operation addition and an operation scale location. Okay, so intuitively, hopefully that kind of makes sense. So we're saying that W is a set, which is a subset of the set V, which is part of the team of three things that make up the vector space V. Okay, so if that happens, so, the, so, so a subset W with that is called a subspace of V if, W itself is a vector space. Now, under the addition and scalar operations defined on V. Now, when, here it meant a set W, okay? is a subset of a set V, where V is, is the set in the triple of three things that make up a vector space also called V. Here, W is being referred to as a vector space, okay? Where W is the set making up the team of three things called the vector space W, okay? So, they're using W to mean both a set W and the vector space W, where the set is W, you have an operation addition and operation scale multiplication. Okay, and this is if W is itself a vector space where W is the set, the operation is of addition is the operation of addition done on V, but restricted to only W, and the scalar multiplication is on the same as V, except it's restricted to W. Okay, meaning you're doing addition the same way in W, except W is a subset of V, and so it's only an operation on the subset W of V. It can't be on all of V because W is a subset. Of v. Okay, and same thing for scale multiplication. This is the definition for a subspace. Okay, if W is itself a vector space under those two operations already defined on V, but restricted to the subset W of V. Okay. This is the definition of a subspace. Now, theorem uh, 4.2.1. If W is a set of one or more vectors in a vector space B, then, then W is a subspace of B, if and only if the following conditions are satisfied. A, if U and V are vectors in W, then U plus V is also in W. Okay, and this is called closure in W under addition. It's saying if you take two vectors in W, then their sum is also in W. B, property B says if K is a scalar and U is a vector in W, then KU is also a vector in W. And so this is called closure under scalar closure in W under scalar multiplication. Yeah, I could abbreviate the word, but I'm just gonna write, write more things out than abbreviating at this point. Okay, so if K is a scalar and U is a vector in W, and KU is also a vector in W, it's called closure in W under scalar multiplication. If you take a scalar K and multiply it by a vector U and W, the result KU is also a vector in W. Okay. So what this is saying is that if you have a set of vectors that are in a vector in a set B, set B for a vector space B, right? So if you have a set of vectors that lie in a vector space B, 
meaning the set B in the team of three things called vector space B. So if you have a set of vectors in vector space B and they're closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication, then um, that subset is a subspace. It's a vector space in its own right, but it's a vector space which lies within the vector space B. And so it's a called a vector subspace of B or just a subspace of B. Okay. Okay, so if W is a set of one or more vectors in a vector space B, then W is a subspace of B if and only if it's closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication. Okay, so this is good because if you have, if you have, if you already know things are vector spaces. Okay, so if you already know things are vector spaces, which take proving 10 axioms, right? If you can show, if you, to show something in a vector space, you originally have to show all 10 axioms. If you now know some things are vector spaces after doing all that work, then if you have a set of things lying in a vector space, you can say, well, is this a vector subspace of, of my thing that I already know is a vector space? Well, if it's a vector subspace, it itself is a vector space. And so you can show that smaller things are vector spaces by showing their, their vector subspaces of already known vector and to do that, you only need two properties to hold. So once you have that things are vector spaces, it's much easier to find something is a vector subspace than to show it's a vector space. And so it's a fast way, it's faster than proving it itself as a vector space, instead showing it's a vector subspace of something you already know is a vector space. Okay? Okay. That's what theorem, that theorem says. Okay. All right. So the advantage to the above theorem is that it is much easier to show that something is a vector subspace of, a, of an already known thing, of an already known vector space, because there are only two conditions instead of 10. So the advantage to the above theorem is that it is much easier to show that something is a vector subspace of an already known vector space because there are only two conditions in 10 10. Okay, rather than showing it is itself, rather than showing it is a vector space by proving all 10 axioms. Space. Okay, so it speeds things up. So here's example one, and it's the zero vector space, the zero uh, subspace. Okay, so so given, so we there exists, there does exist, exists, it does exist vector spaces. Okay, I can prove to you the space will end by n matrices is a vector space. There's lots of vector spaces. So there do exist, there do exist vector spaces. Okay, every vector space by, by, by definition must have a zero vector. Okay, one of the properties, one of the axioms of vector space is that it has a vector called zero where zero, u plus zero equals zero plus u equals zero for every, every object u in the set B, right? So everything that's a vector, there's at least one vector space and every vector space has a zero vector, okay? Uh, so we can show that the zero set, that the zero space is a, is a vector space by showing it is a vector subspace of any given vector space. Okay, since I can prove to you there exists vector space by just finding one and proving it, by, by proving, by looking at the last theorem, we can prove that the zero subspace is a vector subspace of any given vector space that has to contain zero by definition, okay? Okay, so we need the two axioms, but we already did that earlier. So. Um, if you take the zero plus zero equals zero, and that implies that it's closed under addition. 
Okay. So there we go. Therefore, we have closure under addition. Okay. Also, if you take any scalar k and you multiply by zero, you get zero. And so this implies you have closure under scalar multiplication. And so because those two hold, uh, capital V is equal to only the, the second thing, only the zero vector is a vector subspace of any given vector space. This proves that the zero, that, that V is equal to the set containing zero is a vector space. Okay, so here, if we if we have a, already have a vector space, we can then prove that the zero space is a vector space by showing it as a subspace when there's these two. So the ten from earlier, just these two show it as a vector space as a subspace of any of any given vector space. Okay, it's a vector space for that it is the zero subspace, okay, of a given vector space, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna do in the whiteboard now, so I'm going to draw a table of vectors of subspaces, okay? Quickly. Okay, so we have um, subspaces of R2. Subspaces of two space of R2. And here we have uh, subspaces of, of three space. R3. So subspaces of two space R2 are the zero space, lines through the origin, and all of all of two space. Okay. So the subspaces of two space is just the zero. Set lines to the origin and all two space. Though they're all those are all subspaces of two space. Okay, so for instance, if you have two space, okay, and if you were to just look at a line, now it's lines to the origin. So if you take any line through the origin, that is a vector subspace of two space. Okay, so here's all of R2. And that line through the origin is a vector subspace of two space. Subspace of three space. Again, it's just the number zero, just the zero set. Uh, you also have, just like in two space, you have lines to the origin. Lines to the origin are subspaces of three space. You also have planes through the origin. Those are also subspaces of three space. And we have all of three space as a subspace of three, as a vector subspace of three space. Okay, so to illustrate that, if you have three space, that's the origin. Okay, so they all meet, they all go through the origin. Okay, but let's say you draw a line, now let's draw a plane. And so that plane contains the points at the origin. And so it's a plane that goes through the origin. This is a vector subspace of R3, that plane through the origin. It has to go through the origin to be, um, so R3 is representing all of R3, the black, right, with the X, and then the red is the plane through the origin that does not make up all of R3. It makes up a plane. R3. Plane is two, it's two dimensional, R3 is three dimensional, can't take up. Okay, so that's a uh, subspace of R3. Remember, one of the conditions of a vector 
space is that it contains a zero vector. And so if you have a plane that doesn't go through the origin, it doesn't contain the zero vector for R3, which is the point at the, at the origin, right? Okay, so uh, in order to be a vector space, it has to contain, it has to have the point at the origin. And so there are planes that are subspaces, but they're only planes that go through the origin because they must have the zero vector in, that, in, in it to be a vector space, to satisfy the, one of the conditions of a vector space, one of the 10. Okay, so these are all the types of subspaces of two space and three space. So if you have something in two space that is not the zero set, it's not aligned through the origin, and it's not a little two space, then it is not a vector subspace of two space. If you have a subspace, if you have something in three space that's not the zero set, it's not aligned through the origin, it's not a plane through the origin, and it's not all three space. If it's none of those things and it's in R3, it is not a vector subspace of three space. Okay, so. I am exhausting all possible subspaces of two space and three space here. There are no other ones other than these classes of space spaces. Okay. And so that table is telling you the subspaces of R2 and R3. Okay. Uh, next. Uh, so table of subspaces of two space and three space on whiteboard. Hey, someone remind, make sure to remind me to save the whiteboard uh, before the end of class, okay, when class ends. Example five, okay, subspaces of M sub NN, which is the space of M of N by N matrices. M, capital M sub NN is the space of N by N matrices. So subspaces of that space. The sum of two symmetric matrices is a symmetric matrix. Okay, so a symmetric matrix is one, right, which, which uh, it's transpose is equal to itself, right? Definition, um, a symmetric, a matrix, capital A is symmetric if, a transpose is equal to A, okay? An example of a symmetric matrix is uh, the matrix, if you have a three by three matrix, let's say this diagonal entries don't matter. Let's say this is here, this is here, and this is there. This is an example of a symmetric matrix. When you take its transpose, it's equal to itself. Okay, so uh, this is a this is one example of a symmetric matrix, but it's a matrix in which is transpose is equal to itself. The sum of two symmetric matrices is also a symmetric matrix. A scalar multiple of a symmetric matrix is also a symmetric matrix. That means since the set of all three by three, it's the set of all n by n symmetric matrices is closed under um, addition and closed under scalar multiplication that the set of all n by n symmetric matrices is a vector subspace of capital M sub n n. Okay, so I, I wrote the set just because what I mean by uh, the, the space. Let me put the space. Okay, the space of all n by n symmetric matrices. You can think of it as a set, but then the set with the operation addition scale multiplication makes up a team, which is the vector subspace of M sub N. Okay. So the sum of two symmetric matrices is a symmetric matrix. A scalar multiple of a symmetric matrix is also a symmetric matrix. That means since the set of all N by N, N, by N symmetric matrices is closed in addition and it closes scale multiplication as a subset of the set of all N by N matrices, that means that it is a vector subspace of M sub N N. So this shows that the set, the space of n by n, n by n 
the space of n by n symmetric matrices is a vector space as a vector subspace of m sub n n, which is a vector space. Okay. And so I quickly proved that that's a vector space. Okay, doing that. Um, no. Uh, similarly, a set of upper triangular matrices, lower triangular matrices, and diagonal matrices are subspaces, are each subspaces, each subspaces of double M sub n n. They're each spaces of n by n matrices, uh, but each one, and each one is closed under addition to location. And so they're each can be proven to be vector subspaces of the vector space m sub n n. And so they're each vector spaces of their own. Okay, theorem. Uh, theorem 4.2.2. If w1, w2, that's that, that, W sub R are subspaces of a vector space B and B, their intersection, then the intersection of these subspaces is also a subspace of B. So W1 to WR are subspaces of a vector space B then the intersection of these subspaces is also a subspace of B, meaning W1 intersect with W2, that intersect dot, 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 intersect W sub R is also a subspace of B, a vector subspace of B. Okay, so definition, um, if W is a vector in a vector space, capital B, then W is said to be a linear combination of the vectors v1 comma v2 comma da, 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 comma v sub r in capital V if W can be expressed in the form W is equal to uh, k1 v1 plus K2 V2 plus dot 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 plus KR ER, where K1 K2 comma dot 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 comma K sub R are scalars. These scalars are called the coefficients of the linear combination. So this is the definition of a linear combination. Okay, so if W is a vector in a vector space B, then W is said to be a linear combination of the vectors V1 to VR in capital B. If W can be expressed in the form W equals K1 V1 plus K2 V2 plus dot dot plus KR VR, where K, all the Ks are scalars. These scalars are called the coefficients of the linear combination. Okay, so the Ks are each coefficients and and this entire expression, W equaling to this means that W is a linear combination of the vectors V1 to VR. Okay, so this is a this on the right hand side of this equal sign. This is a linear combination of the vectors V1 to VR. This is saying W is that because W equals a linear combination of the vectors V1 to VR. Okay, right. it's just the name of something. Okay, here on four point two point three. So I realize it's a bit hard but it's, it's just the name of an expression of that form, okay? Don't overthink it. So it's just, an, it's just the name of, of, of that. So if S is equal to W1 comma W2 comma da, 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 comma W sub R, uh, so if S is equal to that set, W1 to WR is a non-empty set of vectors in a vector space V, then A, the set W of all possible linear combinations 
of the vectors in capital S is called is is a subspace of V. Okay, so if S is a non-empty set of vectors in a vector space V, then the set W of all uh, possible linear combinations of the vectors in S is a subspace of V. V. The set W in part A is the smallest subspace of V that contains all the vectors in S in the sense that any other subspace that contains those contains these vectors also contains w contains all and also also contains all of w okay so for part B, it says the set W in part A is the smallest subspace of V that contains all the vectors in S, in the sense that any other subspace that contains these vectors, meaning W and WR, any other subspace that contains all of them also contains all of the set capital W, the set of all possible linear combinations of the vectors W1 to WR in the capital S. Okay, the set W, capital W, of all possible linear combinations of these are our vectors is a subspace of V, okay? It's closed under addition, it's closed under scalar multiplication, um, and it's a set containing only vectors in a vector space V, objects only in a vector space V. Definition, I, I proved A very quickly. Okay, if S, if S is equal to W1, Comma W two comma dot, dot, dot comma W sub R is a non-empty set of vectors in a vector space B. Then the subspace W of B that consists of all possible linear combinations of the vectors in capital S is called subspace of, of capital B generated by capital S. And we say that the vectors W1 to W sub R span capital W. We denote this subspace as capital W is equal to the span of the set W1 to WR. Or W equals the span of S capital S. Definition, if capital S is equal to the set W1 to WR is a non-empty set of vectors in a vector space V, then the subspace W of V that consists of, that, that consists of all possible linear combinations of the vectors in S is called the subspace of V generated by S. Okay, so the set, of space, the set of all linear combinations of these vectors is the subspace of V generated by this set S. And we see that the vectors W1 to WR span capital W. We denote the subspace as W is equal to the span of W1 to WR, okay? So the span of these vectors is a vector subspace of capital V, okay? And we call that vector subspace capital W. Here, we're saying we're labeling capital W with the span of those vectors. Okay, example 11, the standard unit vectors in uh, the, the standard unit vectors span Rn and space. 
the standard unit vectors span R n. Okay, so um, so what are the standard unit vectors in R n? Right, we have the standard unit vectors are e one, which is the first one's e one, which is one in the first component and zero everywhere else where there are n components. E two is a zero in the first component, one in the second, zero everywhere else, right? So E2 has a one in the second component and zero everywhere else. E3 has a one in the third component and zero everywhere else, okay? Comma dot dot dot, comma the last one, EN, is a zero everywhere except the last component, the nth component, is a one. So EI has a one in the ith position and zero everywhere else. Okay, so these are the standard unit vectors in RN. E1, E2, E3, E4, dot, 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 up to including EN. Those are the N standard unit vectors in RN. So in this example, we were showing the standard unit vectors, these N vectors, E1 to EN, span RN. And what that means is that the span of those vectors is all of RN, okay? to show that these n unit vectors of n space span our n, we want to show that um, the span, I'm repeating the same word, to show that these n vectors of r n span our n, uh, we want to show um, that, that the set of all linear combinations of E1 comma E2 comma dot 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 comma E sub n is all of R n. Okay? okay. A linear, so no. A linear combination of E1, E2 comma dot 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 comma E n. But it's a, let me see. Any linear combination of E1 to EN is um, an N tuple. Okay. If you take these vectors, right, they're each N tuples, and you multiply each, any of the, each of them by a constant, you get another N tuple. And when you add those constant multiples, you get another N tuple. So any linear combination of E1 to EN is an N tuple. And so that means the set of all linear combinations of E1 comma E2 comma dot 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 comma EN. Th that means the set of all linear combinations of E1 to EN is at least is a subset of RN, right? So we know that we can't get a linear combination of E1 to EN and it not be an N-tuple. It, it's, it's always going to be an object in RN. So what is left to prove is that any n tuple or any object in Rn can be expressed as some linear combination of E1 comma E2 comma dot 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 comma En. Okay, so if we show that, we already know that linear combinations are only n tuples, and then we want to show that each n tuple is a linear combination, and then they're the exact same thing. We already know that one set sits inside the other. We want to show that the other set, set it sits inside the first. If they both fit inside each other, they're actually both the same thing. Okay, so we want to show that any n tuple can be expressed as some linear combination of e1 to en. So assume. So choose an n tuple at random. Choose an n tuple um, arbitrarily. Usually, mathematicians will say it. So we can say arbitrarily. Okay. Choose an n tuple arbitrarily. Uh, call it. Um, call, call it. Call it v is equal to v one comma v two comma dot 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 comma v sub n. Okay, so this can be any n tuple, the values of v1 to vn could be anything. 
uh, I want to show that this is a linear combination of P1, Tn. Okay. Well, then uh, V, which is equal to V1, comma V2, comma dot dot dot, comma V sub n is equal to um, V1, E1 plus V2, E2 plus dot 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 plus V n E n. Okay. E1 is the vector where there's only one in the first component and zero everywhere else. If I multiply that by the constant V1, that means I have a V1 in the first component. That's the first component of V. E2 is the vector with only one in the second component. If I multiply that by the constant V2, that means I only have a V2 in the second component and zero everywhere else. So this first product tells you there's a V1 in the first component and zero everywhere else. The second thing says the V2 in the second component and zero where else, dot, dot, dot. The last thing says there's an, a Vn in the nth component and zero where else. If we add all these vectors, the sum of these products is V1 in the first component, V2 in the second, V3 in the third, dot, 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 Vn in the last. That's vector V. So I've managed, I've, I've, I've now shown V, I've expressed V as equaling to V1, E1 plus V2, E2 plus dot, 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 plus Vn, En. I've shown that V is a linear combination of the standard unit vectors of Rn, E1, E2, to En. And so since I've arbitrarily chosen a vector in Rn and shown that can, it can be expressed as a linear combination of the standard unit vectors in Rn, that in addition to what I said earlier, that means that the standard unit vectors, the span of the standard unit vectors is all of Rn, okay? And so this shows that any vector v in rn in rn uh, can be expressed as a linear combination of the standard unit vectors um, you know of rn okay so uh, span of the standard unit vectors is all of R. And so that's example 11. Okay. Okay, so I'm recording this lesson, so you can look at this again and you can read the notes. Uh, this takes a lot of studying in order to understand this. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, keep going. Um, Okay, so I'm going to draw some pictures now. Okay, so, okay, so if you're in uh, R3, so if you're in all of R3 and you have a vector V like this, then you can talk about the span of that vector V. And the span of that vector V is just the line that goes through V through the origin. Okay, so that line contains the vector V. It's not going around like that. That's a line and V is through that line. And so the span of V is the line going through the vector V and through the origin. Uh, right, so the span of V is the, set, is the set of all linear combinations of a vector. Well, if you look at that vector, if you take any constant multiple of that vector, uh, that's the span of V. Okay, so the span of that vector V, the span, of a single vector v is equal to the set of all linear combinations of one vector v. Now, when you have only one vector v, it's weird because the, you're taking the set of linear combinations of a single thing, and but that equals the set of all uh, scalar multiples of that vector v. So the span of that vector v is the set of scalar multiples of that vector v, only because there's only one vector in the set v. If I had a set v comma w, it'd be different. But with just one vector, the span of a single vector is the set of all the, of all constant multiples of it. And so if you just take any constant multiple of vector v, you end up with the line through that vector, where each point in the line corresponds with a different constant multiple of that vector. Okay, I could say two times v is a point twice as far along the line. Negative 2v is twice as far, but in the opposite direction. 
half V is a point halfway along the vector V. And so as you, as you exhaust all real numbers, you, 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 you exhaust all the points on the span of V that line through the vector V. Okay, so the span of a single vector is a line through that vector V through the origin. Um, if you take the span of two vectors, um, it's the plane through the origin uh, determined by those two vectors. Okay, so I need to make class a little bit longer to have a lot of material. Uh, so please just stay a little bit longer while I cover a little bit more material. So if you have the x-axis, uh, y-axis, and z-axis, um, then uh, let's say you have two vectors. You have a vector v1, and you have a vector uh, v2. Okay, then you can talk about uh, the plane, uh, the span of these two vectors. And so the span of these two vectors is just the plane determined uh, by these two vectors to the origin. So for instance, here's the origin where the, both these two vectors start at. Before we talked about the parallelogram determined by two vectors. So you could think about that parallelogram. Now think about the plane that contains that parallelogram and uh, it goes out in all directions infinitely far. And so the span of those two vectors in this space is this plane going through that contains the parallelogram determined by those two vectors. So that plane is the span of those two non-collinear vectors, V1 comma V2, okay? I'm saying they're non-collinear, right? If they were collinear and they were in the same line, then the span of two vectors would be the span of either one of them. It would just be a line that would go through both those vectors where they're, they're each, they're collinear, so they, they both can be put on the same line, right? Most vectors cannot be put on the same line. What most vectors go one direction, the other one goes another direction, as so they can't both be fit into the same line. So when you have two vectors like that, they're non-collinear, then the only way they can fit in a space is if they're bigger than a line. The space has to become a plane. And so the span of two vectors that are non-collinear, with that condition non-collinear, the span of two non-collinear vectors is a plane. You now need a larger space, to, to cover the entire span of two non-collinear vectors. Okay, so then that's the span of two non-collinear vectors and that's the picture of that. Okay, um, so next, uh, this is example um, 14. Okay, so class needs to be a little longer because I need to cover more material. Continue, consider the vectors u, which is equal to the vector one comma two comma negative one and v, which is equal to the vector um, six comma four comma two in R3. Okay. Uh, show that W is equal to, show that W is equal to nine comma two comma seven um, is a linear combination of U and V. And that W prime which is equal to four comma negative one comma eight uh, is not a linear combination of u and v, okay? Um, right now we are doing um, 4.2 on subspaces. We finished um, 4.1, right? So I'm still gonna need to teach a little longer. Uh, but uh, I'm going to sign the homework now. Okay, so the homework is going to be 4.1, numbers 7 and 9. Okay, um, 4.1. Okay, 4.1, number 7 and 9. Okay, 4.1, uh, 7 and 9. Homework is. 4.1, number seven and nine. Homework for next class. Okay, 4.1, number seven. Exercise is 4.1 from seven and nine. Okay, but I, I need the class to be a little longer to come with material, so let's keep going. I'm just gonna have the homework right there underneath as I type. Okay, so, um, so in this example, I wanna show that these two, uh, w is a linear combination of these two vectors and that W prime is not. Okay, so, um, okay, so W 
is equal to the vector nine comma two comma seven. I want to show it is linear combination of u and v. So I want to show there exists scalars k1 and k2 such that w is equal to k1 u1 plus k2 v2. That means that equals to k1 times u, which is this vector, plus k2 times this vector, which is six comma four comma two. Okay. So I want, so we want to show that there are, there exists two scalars, K1, K1 and K2, such that that equation holds, such that the following equation holds that equation, okay? Um, in other words, uh, instead of looking at one vector equation, because this is this vector equals a constant times this vector plus constant times that one. In other words, uh, we can separate each component. You can say that the first component, which is K1 plus six K2, K1 plus six K2 on the right side is equal to nine on the left side. And that equals to two K1 plus 4k2, the second component equals the second component on the other side. And that negative k1 plus 2k2, the second third component on the right side equals seven, the right component on the other side. Okay, so in, instead of using one vector equation, we can use three equations that equate each component one at a time. In order for two vectors to be equal, each of their components have to be the same. And so knowing, so assuming that these two vectors are equal means that each of the three components are the same. And so we get three corresponding equations to that one vector equation. Okay, and so now the, the goal is to find solutions, K1 and K2, that satisfy all three of these equations. Okay, so this boils down to finding, um, finding solutions, uh, finding a solution to the above um, linear uh, system, to the above linear system, right? Which we've done before, okay? And so, um, and so you can solve this using uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination if you want. And when you do that, you get that K1 is equal to negative three and that K2 is equal to two. Okay, and so you get a solution and you get that you get that solution. There's only one, it's that one. And so this means that the vector w is equal to negative three u plus two b. Okay, because k1 is the scalar next to u and k2 is the scalar next to b. So w is equal to negative three u plus two b. Okay, so yeah, so I'm I'm I said I was S needs to be a little bit longer because I need to cover a lot of material. It's only been five minutes. Okay, so so now I've expressed W as a linear combination of U and B. And now I also want to show that W prime is not a linear combination of U and B. Okay, so uh, W prime uh, Okay, so 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 um, so let's assume that W prime is a linear combination of vectors u and v. We will see that this leads to a problem. Okay, and then when we that get, when something goes wrong, we'll then realize our assumption was wrong that W prime is a linear combination u and v, which means it is not. Okay, so uh, w prime, right, w prime is equal to this vector, okay? And so this we want to assume is equal to a linear combination of u and v. And so that means that we have k1 times the vector u, this. Okay, so we want to say we're assuming that that happens. Okay, and so correspondingly, correspondingly, 
we get these equations. Now we get the equations for each a component. We have k1 plus 6k2 is equal to 4. We have 2k1 plus 4k2 is equal to negative 1. And we have negative k1 uh, plus 2k2 is equal to 8. Okay, so we have now these three equations. Um, okay, and so when you try to solve this system, um, okay, so if we if we add um, negative two times the first equation to the second, we get the following. So this is our original three equations. We then get, this goes away, and then we get negative eight K2, and then we get equals to negative nine. And then I'm also going to add negative two times the first equation to the second, and add the first equation to the third, we get, okay, and then we add the first one to the third, this goes away, this becomes an eight, and this becomes a 12. So we now have these. Now add, third, add the second equation to the third, and get, so now, uh, so now if you add this and this, the negative 8k and 8k cancel, and you get 0. And on the right side, negative 9 plus 12 is 3. So the third equation becomes 0 equals 3. This is false. Okay, it's false that 0 equals 3. And so uh, this means our assumption that w prime and be written as a linear combination of u and v is false. So w prime cannot be written as a linear combination of u and v. Okay, and so that proves that. Okay, uh, okay, so we'll stop there and we'll continue next time. And so I signed the homework for next class. Uh, it's 4.1 number seven and nine. Um, I, I recorded.